have your Bible, would you turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Paul, after speaking of the majesty of the gospel, says this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Jesus Christ, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in sinful man, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who not living according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's laws, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die, but by the Spirit you put to death the, misde the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you do not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you receive the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share the sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. And I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet do not have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans and word that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to God's will. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died? More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered a sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through them who loved us. 
For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray. Father, first we're going to start by saying amen to what Paul just wrote. We thank you for what you have done for us. We thank you for the hope that we have. We thank you for the fact that what you did by sending your son is justified and is reinforced and is verified by the presence of your spirit in our lives. And Father, forgive us when we take this message of hoping for what you have done, trusting in what you have accomplished, and awaiting patiently and eagerly what you are still to do, and we turn it into things that are more about us and less about you. Father, forgive us when we elevate ourselves and lower Christ. When we desire our own thought process and ignore your spirit. When instead of being the children that you are, we still go back and be disobedient. Father, instead, allow us today to see clearly what you're doing for us. And when we see you clearly, may it make us love you more dearly. And may it make us draw to you more dearly. It's in the name of your Son, through the power and the groaning of your Spirit, we pray in his name. Amen. I can become extremely popular today by only focusing on one verse in this passage. We can just look at Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And we can decide to explain that passage in a variety of ways, and I've seen it done. And then at the end, I could uh, have the guys take up another offering and tell you all the promises that will come if you will fulfill certain financial amounts. I know, because I've seen people who do this. I can make all kinds of promises to you. What are your problems? Are they financial? Are you suffering through a financial crisis? Are, are you worried about what you may have or what you've lost? Well, God works all things in his glory, and the promise I give you is that God will give you a great house and great possessions. You just need to wait and hope for it. As long as I ignore the fact that Jesus himself said this of himself, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. But maybe your problem this morning is you're faithful, but physically you're just not well off. If you'll just put your trust in Jesus, if you are faithful, maybe you're just struggling with your faith. And what I need to tell you today, brothers and sisters, in Romans 8, 28, you need to claim it and know this, that if you are faithful to God, he will give you all health. As long as I ignore the fact that Timothy, preaching faithfully as a good soldier, Paul said, was reminded by Paul that he needs to stop drinking only the water because the pressures of ministry and the people are giving him ulcers. And he needs to use a little wine, medication, because of his stomach and his frequent illnesses. Or maybe, maybe your thoughts are that Romans 8, 28 is the promise, so that as long as I am faithful, I will get to retire in a peaceful, nice life with a condominium, and my last days will be greater than any days I've ever known before. Because God's going to work it all out for me. As long as I ignore the fact that faithful John in his 90s wrote these words, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering, in kingdom, and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. Found myself when I wrote Revelation on the island of Patmos. Why? Because I had been exiled there because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Or maybe today, brothers and sisters, I need to remind you that Romans 8, 28 is that bumper sticker that you need to put on your life and remind yourself that there is no safer place there is no safer place than being in the will of God. But before I tell you that, you need to tell that story to men like Jim Elliott and Nick Saint 
and the other three men who went into Ecuador to reach a tribe of people who had never heard the message of the gospel and as a result found themselves dead at the spear of this tribe. Maybe there's more to Romans chapter 8 than oftentimes what we want it to be in American Christianity. Maybe it's more than just the pursuit of a glorified American dream that we try to baptize and go for the same things that society that we live in wants and say that it's what Jesus promises. In fact, I think there are three things just in this passage, and there's probably more, but three things today we can look at that are promises that remind us of the strength that we have the strength that we have received in the spirit that came ours as a, as a result of our relationship with Christ Jesus. Verses 1 through 11, we see that we have our peace. We have peace with God. We have love and peace, actually, Paul says. In verse 6. If our mind is controlled by the Spirit, we have life and peace. Why do we have peace? Well, we have peace because of what verse 1 said. If you are in Jesus, there is therefore what? <coughs> no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, two weeks ago at the end of the service, I told you that I was going to Indiana and I got to go to a preaching summit, which I wanted to go to. But up until three days before that, I wasn't sure I was going to go to. Three years ago, I was involved in an accident on a backcountry road, my car, two bicycles, and legally, there was no condemnation. The ruling of the judge, or the, the ruling of the deputy on scene was it was a no-fault accident. Indiana is a fault state which means it could have been very obvious that either I or the bicyclist was in the wrong place at the wrong time and one of us was guilty for this accident. But, three years later, that case was still sitting over my head because while criminally I had no fault and had been found innocent, somebody had found an attorney who thought that since I had insurance, we could go ahead and try to find guilt in me somehow in any way. Which means, for the last three years, it's been in the back of my head, especially when they started saying stuff like, you've got to fill out paperwork and answer questions and have court dates scheduled and try to figure out what in the world's going on. Can I tell you something? I am convinced that I was innocent, but the longer that went on, you know what I started to wonder? What happens if 12 people decide that there is still condemnation? And what happens? When the guy is suing for beyond the coverage and the liability that my insurance was, and then I got to figure out how in the world I will take care of that. I started wondering, therefore, what, what I would do. And I remember the old, uh, I kind of love the fact that I'm referring to stuff within my lifetime as the old, the old sitcom Seinfeld. And in the fourth season, Jerry decides that he was going to write a TV title. <coughs> And the premise of that episode was that Jerry is in an accident with someone who had no insurance and he had to become his butler. I started to wonder, I wonder if I can negotiate that with this uh, ambulance chaser attorney, his client, and the judge of the county, if somehow that's what I was going to have to do, become an indentured servant in the 21st century, because I could not figure out any other way. There was no peace. Romans chapter 8. Here's what Paul says. You want peace? Here's how you <laughs> have peace. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are found no longer at fault for your sins. And because of who Jesus is, Because of who Jesus is. There's no need to bring it up again. The grace of God has covered you more than any liability of your sin could ever come back to haunt you if you will. 
will just hold on and trust him. And as a reminder of that, let me present to you the insurance agent of the Trinity, the Spirit of God that now lives within you. To remind you of the fact that your strength in God comes from what he has done for you. So have the peace and the love of God with you. Now I know that's not near as exciting. Not near as exciting as some people want to make the Holy Spirit out to be. It's not near as cool as a guy breathing on a man with sunglasses on who suddenly can see. It's not near as cool as somebody waving their hand under the power of the Spirit and a man in a wheelchair standing up. But I'm going to tell you this right now. I think I'd rather have this concept of the Holy Spirit than one who just performs things that charlatans can mimic and imitate as well. And what becomes even greater and what becomes even more powerful than the blind seeing and the lame walking is when the Spirit starts to fulfill those promises we find down in Matthew verses 9. When we become controlled by the Spirit and our sinful nature starts to depart. When we walk in Him and we transform and we're changed. <clears throat> then we know that He's loved us and we have the peace. And we know that this isn't just something that started at the resurrection. Paul said this to the Thessalonians, But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning, from the beginning of what? Well, you look at what Paul says in Ephesians, probably from the beginning of when God decided that he would even consider taking the time to speak a few words and make a universe. And when he decided that in that universe, he would reach down and grab a little dust and breathe his life into it and create man. And when he realized that man should not be alone and be just one guy walking the planet for the rest of eternity, but that there should be a woman to go with him, and as a result, they should create families. And then he saw that when he did this, they would choose sin. And then he decided he would choose to redeem us anyway. Probably that beginning. God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace. We have a peace treaty that is not dependent on what we do, but is dependent on what God has done. We have love. We have love that isn't Dependent on that moment when you screw up bigger than life and there's reason not to love. You ever had people in your life who loved you up until that one moment that they can never forget and never forget? You have people in your own life that you love up until that moment they did something that you to this day cannot forget and cannot forgive. There is therefore now no Because it's not dependent on us, it's dependent on him. It's not our love, it's his love, which is a great love. It's the love that is so great that Jesus laid down his life, not for us because we were his friends, but because he loved us even when we were his enemies and wanted us to be his friends. That's the friend that we have in Jesus. And that begins our definition of grace. It takes Philip Yancey, 70 pages to get to the point where he begins to define grace in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace. This is his definition. Grace makes its appearances in so many forms that I have trouble defining it. I am ready, though, to attempt something like a definition of grace when it comes to our relationship with God. Grace means there's nothing we can do to make God love us more. No amount of spiritual calisthenics and renunciations, no amount of knowledge gained from seminaries and divinity schools, no amount of crusading on behalf of righteous causes. And grace also means there is nothing we can do to make God love us less. No amount of racism or pride or pornography or adultery or even murder. Grace means that God already loves us as much. I think back to the sad moment in a minister's office when an elder in a congregation came in and said this, well, I've always thought about it this way. 
all the calisthenics and all the good things I do will be placed on one side of the scales. And all the adultery, pornography, murders that I do will be placed on the other side of the scales. And I just hope it balances in my favor. No Romans 8 for him. He did not understand the peace and the love that he had by understanding there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, I think that's greater than just turning God into your cosmic slot machine who will take care of all of your personal needs. What do I do? Once we figure out this peace, we then find out that we still have a purpose. That we were created for something more than presenting ourselves once again as a slave to sin. Number one, we find it right there in verse 12. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. You've got a job to do. We're called to serve this God who loves us, not so we will earn his favor. We've already got that. What are we called to serve him for? One, because it's what you were created to be. So I'm saying, <clears throat> you once were a piano that sat in a dusty corner, completely out of tune. Now that Jesus has come and repaired you, go out there and play the song that you were meant to play. That's all it means. Restore to what we were created to do, to bring honor and glory to the Creator. <coughs> the creature honors the Creator by fulfilling his duty and his purpose. If God were a military recruiter, he would probably tell us that we are now to what? Be all you can be. that we can be. And we be what we can be because we were created by I am who I am. And we begin to imitate him. And the spirit begins to help us to imitate him. Notice that? The spirit is the one that gives us the power to put to death the sinful nature. The spirit is the one that gives us life. Of course, Paul says in Galatians, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with passions and desires. And we live by ourselves, working hard to show God that what he did was right. Oh, wait. That's not how that <laughs> verse ends. Since we live by the church attendance so people will know how good we are. <laughs> Since we have our daily devotions. No, 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 no. Now all these things are an outpour not of earning God's favor or showing God's favor, but they are proof that we live by the Spirit. Let us keep them in step. And how do we keep it in step with the Spirit? We listen to the Spirit. We listen to what He's been involved in in Revelation. What He's already done through the power of the Holy Scripture. We listen when He works with our conscience to bring about conviction of our sins. So I used this illustration last week. I'm glad I forgot it because it works better here. This portion of Galatians where we stay in step with the Spirit. One of the things that will lead us not to listen is when we just decide not to listen. That's what the Bible warns us of about hardening our heart again. It's the thing that you find in Hebrews 6 where some with the troubles of the world decided not to listen to the message that Jesus was Messiah, but instead rejected him and went back to the Jewish community. It's what you see in 2 Peter and Jude where people started listening to false teaching because it promised more things. And they did what they wanted to do. They didn't listen to what the Spirit said. <coughs> Despite all that the Spirit wanted to do for them. Anybody seen the show? <clears throat> and this is the kind of 
Tells me a little bit about what it means to visit my mother now. And I see the show of my 600 pound life. This is a story about a bariatric clinic, the best I could figure out from the one episode I saw, where when people get to a certain size, they decide they want to do something about it, and they go to this clinic, and they're told all the things they have to do to prepare for the surgery, and then they're told all the things they're supposed to do in recovery for the surgery. So last week, while I was losing my mom, they had an episode of a lady who uh, was told to lose 140 pounds, and then they would consider her for the surgery. Well, she did it. They have the surgery. She loses like another 50, 80 pounds while she's recovering in the hospital. And then the doctor says to her as he sends her home, here's what I need you to do. You need to get up three times a day and, and walk. You need to eat three meals. You need to quit snacking on stuff. You need to eliminate the carbs. And here's what will happen. You're going to lose 15 pounds a week. And when I see you in, in 60 days, you're going to have lost another 120, 150 pounds. She shows up, and they keep a nice little thing showing where they show you her current weight. She left the hospital, I think, at like 486. 60 days later, for her doctor's appointment, anybody want to guess what the number was? 484. You were close, but you went over, so you do not win the car. I'm sorry. <laughs> She came in at 484, and she was ecstatic. She had lost two whole pounds in 60 days. She had not been losing weight before then. And the doctor went, you were supposed to lose 120 pounds. Guess what happened? She went home, and she was in so much pain from the surgery, she just couldn't move around. She went back to laying in her bed and having her son, who was enabling her, which my mother and I argued over, but he was enabling her, running down to the Taco Bell, bringing her her normal food. She was eating smaller portions multiple times a day. When they would go out, she wasn't walking. She was riding in one of those hover round type vehicles. In fact, by the third visit, where she's down to a whopping 478 pounds, she runs her little vehicle right into the doctor's office to go to the scale. And at that point, you know what the doctor said? Nothing else I can do for you. You know why? Because you've decided there are two natures at play here. One is your old nature and the way it's supposed to be. The other is the returning nature. This is why Paul says to us in Romans 8, you know what you do? You listen to the one who calls out and helps us cry for the Father, Abba. You know, listen to the Spirit that now is at work in you. I think oftentimes in our Christian life, we have decided that we had the surgery of Jesus, and now we're going to take it from here. And what we do is the things that are put into our life to help us listen to the Spirit, we, instead of worshiping the Father, through the power of the Spirit, through the hope that comes in the Son, we take those other things and we kind of worship them and ignore the power of the Spirit. And then wonder why life oftentimes is worse off than it was before. Or we get excited when we decide today, I love somebody I never would have loved. It only took me 412 years to get there. And instead, the message we receive is this. The voice we listen to is the spirit that lives within us. It is the spirit that produces this kind of activity inside us. And our job is to stay in step with him. There are all kinds of voices we can listen to. The critical voices of the outside saying there's no reason to trust Jesus. The internal struggle we talked about last week, where the devil tries to convince us, are you really sure that this message is true? Come on, we're, this is the 21st century. Everybody else has clued up that this is just a bunch of fairy tale stuff. This is nothing more than Zeus on Mount Olympus. This is nothing more than any of those other fairy tales that they teach in English classes now. And we laugh at that mythology. How can you not go ahead and believe that? Or the power inside our own selves to go, I can never be any better, so why continue? 
when you start listening to the voices outside the spirit. I want you to walk softly. I'm going to hit you with a big stick here. Well, I wouldn't have, but the guy who said what I'm about to quote would have, from what I understand. Listen to the words of Teddy Roosevelt. It's not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the door of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strides valiantly, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who have never known neither victory nor defeat. An obligation to serve, which then leads to an obligation to listen. And then, as we struggle through a world that is in opposition, we then eagerly hope and know that we're not just going to find ourselves just not with the timid souls, but we're going to find ourselves eagerly expecting the future glory. The future glory that Paul says in verses 18 through 27 is the world is even looking forward to. Every time there's an earthquake, every time there's a thunderstorm, every time there's a tornado, every time there's a hurricane, just a reminder, that's a world in birth pangs waiting for the day when Jesus comes back and makes us all right and better. Where the full glory of God comes out, they're looking forward to it, so continue on, fight the fight, listen to the Spirit, and stay with Him. <coughs> Where does this power come from? Where does our peace come from? Where does our purpose come from? Oh, verses 28 through the end of the book. From the presence of the Spirit Himself. His presence in our life. That, verse 28, the fact that the Spirit is with us in this world, allowing us, no matter what comes, to know that God is working everything to His divine purpose, even the things that today seem to be horrible, God can redeem them. The things that make no sense, He can redeem them. And that didn't just start today. It started before today. I always love the fact that that comes after this passage. Look what comes after. Don't read Romans 8.28 by itself. I know we like to pluck little memory verses out, but always look at context around it. How do we know that all things God works for the good of those who love him? Well, because we're part of this message of redemption. For God foreknew, he also predestined. God's working things out happened before you even had a process in this. He worked a process. He worked a plan of salvation that would conform us to the likeness of his son. He made Jesus, and through the resurrection, the firstborn among many brothers. And not only has this been the predetermined plan of God, it's also the plan by which he justifies us. And it's also the plan by which the glorification will come. For those whom he predestined, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And that's when life gets hard. And when life doesn't work the way that oftentimes we make it out to be. When Jesus turns out to be more than just a self-help seminar and an achievement of all of your great fantasies, all of your great goals, and the ability just to become better than the next guy. When Jesus is more than the stuff that they're showing right now because it's a uh, pledge month again on PBS, so everything's about a better heart, a better way of understanding your mind, a better way of understanding everything. Jesus is more than that, even when it doesn't seem that way. Even when tragedy strikes, even when trouble comes, even when disease hits, even when finances aren't where they need to be, even when life isn't the way it is, that's when Paul reminds you, don't move. Don't you dare leave. Don't you quit. Don't you give up. Don't follow the ways of some who have. No, 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 no. In all of these struggles... 
We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And that's where Paul was convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So stay where you are. Everybody else is leaving. Everybody else is quitting. What are you going to do? I mean, come on. It used to be easy to be a Christian in America. It was the majority religion. It's what the country was. Semantically. But the tide is turning. I don't know. Other voices are constantly concerned and worried that persecution around the world is coming next. What are you going to do? Society promises that if you'll just make a few concessions, life will be easier. We can abandon the truth of the Spirit for a compromise. So you're not seen as just being narrow-minded, not being one of those people who just doesn't get it, one of those people who's trying to keep us in the Stone Age, or at least old-fashioned times with our thought process. What are you going to do? Do you hold on to Christ, or do you say, mm. The reason for the introduction is many of us think Romans 8.28 is the solution to all of our financial worries. It is the grand panacea for all of our physical health needs and worries. It's the grand issue of what it means to live life where you just know that one day you will have a bed and a pillow and you will calmly close your eyes and that will be the end. Some of us have seen Christianity as an understanding where there isn't any trouble. Where, where it's what the majority does and it's what accepted. But as we go through Romans, that's not what the Romans knew. It's not what the writer of Romans knew. But they were convinced, and Paul was convinced that Romans 8.28 is true. That God's work is purpose anyway. Paul was convinced that there is no reason to abandon Christ. Because really, when it comes down to it, there are only two things that can separate you from God. God who chooses to separate him from yourself. And he already told you that ain't happened. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know this because you have peace and love in the Spirit, verse 6. That leaves you. God loves you enough. He's not going to tie you down and tell you you have to say... Paul was convinced there's nowhere else to go. And others have found that Romans 8.28 was true as well. Like Steve saying, the son of Nick saying, who goes around the country telling his father's story with a man who his children called grandfather from that same tribe that took the life of his father and those other four men. You know what's interesting? The man his children called grandfather didn't just take the lives of those, just not part of the tribe that took their lives. He was part of the men who took the lives of those very men. But when coming into Christ, Steve Saint's children called this man who murdered their actual grandfather, now their grandfather. As Steve Saint, understanding what God has done by the one who died and raised again, calls him a brother in Christ, more importantly. John, who found persecution at the age of 90, exiled to Patmos, also was the coming of Christ in the hope of heaven. Timothy, who while serving God found illness still part of it. 
possibly ulcers from dealing with the very people of God. I know that's an imaginable, unimaginable thought. But it was Timothy who had been reminded when he was in Corinth with Paul that this body that we have is so imperishable and in the resurrection of the dead it will be raised imperishable. And the very Jesus who came and dwelt among us and said, I have no place to lay my head, is the same one who made this promise. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And until you get there, his spirit reminds you, for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation, but there are reservations. There is no condemnation, and there is a reservation for the Father's house, in which there are many, many, many rooms. And in case you're afraid there's no room for you, today's the day where Jesus said, I go to prepare a place. Maybe there isn't a room for you today. But if you want to make a reservation today, Jesus says, I'm preparing them. I can go ahead and add another room. I got the blueprints right here. I am a carpenter, remember. I can put a room on the place for you. As our worship team comes, if today you need to find the peace and the love that comes to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, to receive the gift of the Spirit, we invite you. Would you stand this morning for our invitation?